Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day. It is Saturday. It is the fourth day of May, year of our Lord, 2024. I do pray this finds you well. Uh, it's nice outside still, but boy, the wind kicked up and you know it was relatively very nicely warm today. So it feels a little cool, chilly. Yeah, it's amazing how quickly we get used to it. I think the low when we wake up tomorrow morning is going to be in the like 48, 49 degrees, so it's going to feel a lot cooler than it has the last couple of mornings. But that's okay. I think we have the rain, I haven't checked the weather. It was supposed to rain this afternoon, but I think that slid um, to the northeast of us. It may still occur. Don't know. I haven't checked. Tomorrow is Confirmation Day. It's also the sixth Sunday after Easter. Also a week, uh, or not a week away, but this coming Thursday, we will celebrate the Ascension as we do. It's always on a Thursday. 40 days after Easter, uh, and that'll be at 6.30 on Thursday, this coming week. Um, remember, uh, uh, we're also going to celebrate with the youth group, the circuit-wide youth group tomorrow at Emmanuel, Cinco de Mayo, and that will start at 4.30, 4.30 in the afternoon. We'll have some uh, Hispanic foods, and I got uh, made some black turtle bean soup, which is really tasty, uh, and some Pico de Gallo, it's kind of got Pico de Gallo sauce, not quite as chunky. Anyway, not important. Anybody some uh, pinata and all that, and and some other things to entertain ourselves. So anyway, uh, all the youth are invited to that, and we'll also have the divine service at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord to sing praise to your name, Most High. To herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. And again, according to the daily lectionary this evening, we turn to the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. And tonight we're going to read not the entirety of chapter Luke, but the first 24 verses. So this is chapter 14 of St. Luke. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully, and behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and the Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told the parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He, had, he said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors lest they also invite you in return, and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servants to say to those who had invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, 
Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. And that is the gospel of the Lord. So there's a lot going on there. And uh, maybe we'd back up a little bit and just sort of give ourselves, because we haven't looked at this, we're kind of jumping into the middle of St. Luke. We started with Leviticus, and then we've been doing the Psalms for the last several nights. But we see he sets his face. This goes back to chapter 9. He sets his face to finally go to the Jerusalem for the last time. And and so if we just kind of go back there, that starts after the transfiguration. And, and that kind of turning point is uh, Luke 9, chapter 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And so now they're heading. He sends out the, the 72. Um, he uh, uh, cries out uh, a woe upon unrepentant cities. And uh, the 72 return, and he speaks a little bit about his relationship to the Father and how he rejoices in the Father's will. And then we have the parable of the Good Samaritan and then the episode with Mary and Martha, and he's drawing ever nearer to Jerusalem. And, you know, then obviously there's going to be more, as he gets close to Jerusalem, he's going to run into more Sadducees and Pharisees. And of course, uh, people are going to be headed to Jerusalem as well for the great feast. We hear about the Lord's Prayer, where that's recorded in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. It's in Luke chapter 11. Of course, he's, he, he, don't let that be a stumbling block to you that he repeats himself. There was no Facebook you know, recording devices. He was going to say the same thing in many places. When we read the Old Testament. You know, pop, prophets are working independently of each other, often at the same time in different regions and stuff like that, especially the minor prophets. And they're all saying the same thing. Uh, and that God is very consistent. And we hear about the accusations of... Uh, uh, as he's casting out demons, that he is uh, uh, in league with Beelzebub, uh, the devil. And uh, um, he talks about the sign of Jonah, which is another another uh, prediction of his of what's going to happen, his death and resurrection. Uh, and he's and he's con you know he's continually harassing it, and it's actually the the. The confrontation that he has with the Pharisees and Sadducees is getting more and more heated. He is really challenging them to open their eyes and to look at themselves in, a, in an honest way, in a true way. And then he's, you know, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then we hear the parable of the rich fool. Don't be anxious. You must be ready. Uh, acknowledging Christ before men. The mustard seed of the leaven, or and the leaven, the narrow door. And we could spend a lot of time discussing over that. And then his his lament over Jerusalem. That's and that's where we begin. That's the last thing that we heard in chapter very in, in chapter very in chat at the end of. Uh, uh, well, let's read at the end of chapter thirteen. He's, he went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and once again journeying toward Jerusalem. Remember, he's heading and he's gets getting close, uh, and he gets asked, "Will those who saved be few?" And then the Pharisees come and said, "Get away from here! Herod wants to kill you," and. He says, uh, at the end of all that, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones stones uh, those who are sent to it. Man, that's quite an indictment. It happens to be true. You can go again, read the Old Testament how the leaders in Jerusalem, uh, as they approached the captivity, were very hostile to God's prophets and, and often had them killed. And he says, your house is forsaken. Uh, I will, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Of course, that's the triumphal entry, and even then they won't quite get it. So then we pick up uh, with the text night. So it's a Sabbath, Saturday. You're not supposed to do any work on that day. It's a holy day. Convocation, hear the word of the Lord. Uh, we celebrate the divine service on Sunday. And in a sense, that's our Sabbath, but the Sabbath is Saturday. Uh, Sunday in the ancient world was the first day of the work week. That's why church is in the morning. It has been for a long, 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 long time. So anyway, they're watching him because, you know, these people who interpret the law so narrowly without mercy, without sacrifice, their own sacrifice, their own mercy, you know, the, the mercy that, seeing the mercy that's extended to them, you know, they're watching him carefully. And there's a man who has dropsy. Uh, I've heard that that's epilepsy. Um, uh, perhaps, uh, um, uh, diabetes, when you have a, a 
you know, sugar, your sugar would crash. Um, I think epilepsy is sort of the, what we, we, what we think it to be. I remember hearing about my great grandfather having the drop ceiling, you know, but with that, that was all I remember that word when I was very small. And my grand, great grandfather was gone. But anyway, remember, this is the Sabbath. I'm not supposed to do any work. And Jesus looks at the Pharisees and the lawyers, the people who are, are, you know, are studying the God's law and still can't see it. You know, there's something to be said there that you can study the word of God and miss it. It all depends on how you approach it. What is it for? Is it a rule book? Uh, we read Pastor Wolfmuller's wonderful book. Uh, Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, the book is uh, Has American Christianity Failed? And he comes out of the evangelical church. It's a fascinating book to me. He's a great pastor. Uh, just and a great human being, too. Just a wonderful man. Uh, anyway, pick up a copy of his book. Or you can even pick it up. I will. I've done that for a few people. One of the things he he, he, he holds up is like, you know, the, that for him, in his days as an evangelical, the Bible became basic instruction before leaving earth. And I've heard that every heard Lutheran say that. And that it's the story of Christ. And maybe you can apply that to that sort of understanding. Now, and the way you look at things is, by the way, you called your epistemology. And when you argue with people of other confessions, not scream at each other, but argue, like, you know, try to, to try to reach the truth. Uh, um, you find that you're dealing with different epistemologies. And that'll help you. Keep, keep aware that this the that other people's ways of approaching what scripture is, is different. And they're going to look at it differently. So that's, you actually have to back up stuff and say, let's, how are we looking at this here? What is scripture about? It's about Christ. From the beginning to end. He's everywhere. You know, uh, from the opening pages, the opening sentences of Genesis to the very last you know, sentence of, of Revelation, it's about Christ. So it's interesting that you can read scripture and not come to completely different conclusions. Uh, you're not reading it rightly. We have the blessing of the Spirit. That helps, um, but our sin does get in the way. We often want to use Scripture to, to get the things that we want. You know, so we twist it and pervert it. Or we just read enough where we can, quote, find something that, you know, will support our point of view. And, and, and we just start, you know, throwing quotes at each other and talking past each other. And again, finding out our epistemology is wrong. People do that kind of nonsense all the time. Or they even redefine words. Uh, anyway, so Jesus is going to chip through all that with one simple question. It's always fascinating to me how he he gets, cuts us to our heart by just asking a question. And he does it quite frequently. He'll, people come to him and challenge us, and he'll just turn around and say, how about this? So in this case, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Or what is healing if it's not an act of mercy? You have a fellow human being that's suffering. And... Uh, in, in, you know, if you imagine what that was like in the ancient world, or can't work because they have, you know, some disease or a deformed limb, and we've seen episodes of that, or they're blind, you know, or whatever, you know, mute, deaf, all the things that can happen to the human being, uh, in ways we can be born. Uh, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? I desire mercy, but not sacrifice. You know, I, what is what is illness and these things um, that happen to us uh, except the mark of the fall, mark of the curse that we are all under, sin. Um, anyway, they they remain silent. And, and another little side part here is that this is what sin does. It takes what's good and calls it evil. You know, they, you know they're, they're mad because he's doing a good work on the Sabbath, and he's actually calling them out on it. That makes them even matter. So, so he takes the, the man and heals him. And then he looks at them again. No, There's no really dialogue with the man at all that he heals. Um, and he says, that's recorded for us. You know, Which of you, I mean, what a, what a question he asks on the heels of, is it lawful? He's, he's, throw, he's throwing it back at them. You have a son or an animal that falls into a, that falls into a well on the Sabbath, the day you're not supposed to do any work. Because remember, the Sabbath is for us. Um, won't you immediately, won't you pull him out? And wouldn't you be wrong to not pull him out? And imagine if your son fell in and you did nothing and they drowned, you know, or died. I mean, that's a pretty big sin, right? Uh, you did nothing. And you know, and think about that, doing a sin, watching your your family member. And of course they 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 realize, yeah, that's that's that we wouldn't allow that to happen. So now he goes to this parable of the wedding feast, which comes right on the heels of that. And there's a number of parables like that. And actually in the background of all of this is the Song of Solomon. I won't spend the time talking about that tonight, but the Song of Solomon was huge in the ancient church. 
is read in its entirety every year. Uh, and again, one of the overarching themes of Scripture, of course, the overarching screen, screen, uh, theme is Christ. But who is Christ? Christ is, of course, the Son of God, uh, uh, you know, second person of the Holy Trinity, uh, born of man um, and born of God, you know, fully divine, fully, uh, uh, fully human, as we say, and rightly confess, and we confess in that great Athanasian Creed. But, uh, you know, one of the things, one of the, the things God uses throughout Scripture to demonstrate the relationship between him and us is groom and bride. Christ is the groom, the church is the bride. And so this wedding imagery features largely in Scripture. So he says, you know, those are, there. first of all, there's a group of people that are invited. You know, they got the invitation in their hands and, and they're, you know, but then, you know, um, uh, he says, uh, uh, you know, he, they, they come up with all these excuses. And he says, go out, my, the wedding banquet's going to be full. And if you ignore the invitation, now this is not a decision theology. This is turning your back on what God offers you, uh, running from it. Now he'll keep trying. You know, we see that here. He keeps sending his servants out. He wants the wedding hall to be filled. Uh, uh, but eventually, you know, those who were invited, if they couldn't see it, sorry, you're out. I skipped over a parable, and I want to spend a minute talking about that. Um, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't sit down in the place of honor. Uh, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited. And what that has to do is our whole attitude is we are before God. Now, sometimes I say, and I say this a bit tongue-in-cheek, and I don't want to misinterpret me on this. And, uh, you know, I, there is something to the fact that in a church like ours, and this was the same even at seminary, that we tend to sit more in the back. Now, um, you know, sometimes, like when I was in seminary, so I could get to the coffee a little more quickly, uh, you're there, um, you know, it's not a question of being there. Um, but I, I don't know if, if, if when we, we hear texts like this and we, we study these themes a lot as God's people, that it just sort of subconsciously makes us kind of gravitate towards the back. And especially in a church like ours. Now, there's nothing wrong with sitting up front. And the people, there's a lot of people who sit near the front in church, and they have good reasons for doing so. Um, you don't have to have any reason for doing so. You know, you, uh, uh, when our kids were small, we liked to sit up front because they didn't have all those distractions in front of them. I don't have all those distractions. I'm easily distracted. I don't have all those distractions in front of me. And you kind of felt like you were just sort of engaged with, you know, this dialogue with the pastor. Um, anyway, uh, you, you know, the point is not doing it for show. Now, nobody at church is doing that. But I just think subconsciously as Lutherans, we, we sort of pick up on that. One of these days I'll write a paper about it. Time is running short on that because I'm getting quite old. Uh, but anyway, um, I have a whole, probably like a, probably all pastors, like myself, there's a list of 500 papers that I want to write, little things I want to study, you know, mostly made up in newsletters and stuff like that, but sometimes a little more involved. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, we know when we come into church, we don't come into church as people who are going to offer God, you know, things and then be rewarded. We come into church as beggars. I think one of the great little pieces of information, little bits of history about Luther is that when he died, they cleaned out his, you know, like when we die, uh, unless you die in a hospital, you know, usually you're just kind of in a gown. But let's say you're in your home and you just keel over. That happens. So blessed end. And, you know, the people clean out your pockets. You, know, you, you got to get, you get dressed for your burial and stuff like that. You get, you know, somebody dresses you. So when they clean out Luther's pockets after he died, there's a, a, a number of things like we all have in our pockets throughout the day. Uh, a little scrap of paper says, we are beggars, this is true. And that's when we come into church, in the ancient church, it's not Lutheran, uh, one of the oldest parts of the Christian liturgy, and this goes back very close to the time of Christ, is the, the Kyrie, which is Greek for Lord, uh, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, it's Greek. Lord have mercy, eleison, it's Greek word for mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. And that's what beggars say. What can we possibly offer God? You know, we are we are those people that often reject Him. Uh, unfortunately, He doesn't give up on us. Uh, we we or we read His Word in the wrong way to get what we want, not actually submit to His will, uh, and yet He forgives us. Um, so we come into church not you know 
standing on a soapbox and, and, and talking about how good we are. Uh, but we, we come in as beggars. And I think that's, you know, why we sort of subconsciously, especially the way our, our church service is structured, I'm not saying this apologetically, uh, it's a wonderful thing, is that, you know, we, we're not there to bring attention to ourselves, and people are very uncomfortable with that. I am very uncomfortable, just so, just so you know. Um, uh, I, I does, it doesn't happen in our church. I mean, there are times it does happen in the sanctuary, but not in our church, not during the church service. So they're two different things. But clapping during the divine service, you know, you know, who are we clapping for? Yeah, the, who gets all the glory during the divine? Who's doing all the work in the divine? God. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, it's pretty darn rare in a Missouri Synod uh, church service. I've only heard it a couple of times, but I've been very uncomfortable when it happens. You know, or when people single you out, I'm unco I'm uncomfortable with that as a pastor. I'm there to do the work that God has placed upon me. I'm, I'm nothing. I'm a sinner like everybody else. My time will come. I'm getting old. I won't be around much longer. Uh, uh, either I'll get too old and decrepit to do the work anymore. And you can feel it already happening in your bones. Because uh, we don't really retire. I mean, we move on. You know, we get. You know, maybe can't don't have the physical stamina to do the weekly work. So we we you know, move on to other things. But still, you you almost work all the time as a pastor until the day you can't anymore. Physically, you can't. Um, but, you know, that day's coming, and it'll be somebody else. My picture uh, will, uh, you know, uglify the walls of the of the hallway at church. And, uh, you know, people are within a few years, like, who's that guy? You know, uh, like I walk down the hall, and some of the names I know, I, I've i talked to a couple of the men on the phone. Of course, one I know really well, a guy who's a good friend and a fantastic pastor, the, the man that I followed. Uh, uh, um, you know, so that's nice to have... Uh, um, that, but you know, soon enough, he and I will both be forgotten, uh, and that's fine. You know, it isn't about me. You know, so yeah, you know that this idea of not bringing attention to ourselves is huge. Um, and again, I, I'm very uncomfortable with that as a pastor. You know, I'm there to do my job. Uh, and, and, you know, of course, I have to be comfortable in, in speaking in front of people. And I'm still nervous. Um, still get tongue tied and things like that. And then, really, when I botch something, which you know, somewhere almost every Sunday you want the service to be absolutely perfect, and I botch something, uh, and that can, if it's a big botch, it can really throw you, you know, because it's like you know, you're so you know, you want to do everything so right. Uh, and, and like people who are very close to me can pick it up. They're like, yeah, I can tell you're a little flustered, you know. Um, and it's always me. It's not what other people do and stuff like that. Kids crying stuff like that doesn't bother me at all, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know, um, or, uh, you know, the, you, when I'm getting a, the, I have wonderful elders, but if they're doing something, anyway, I'm getting far afield here. The point is, it's never about us. Now, notice how this little part unfolds here. You, know, you sit in the lowest place. And again, I think we pick up on that. And, and that's an attitude, not physically where you sit. Sit where you want in church. Again, I'm not, I'm not calling anybody out in church. I'm just saying, you just, just, if you're there on any Sunday, where do most people tend to sit? I mean, some pastors have done things like try to, they, they've, <laughs> there was a pastor, um, uh, I, it was years and years before I, I was a pastor at that church. And the, the story had it that he put ropes uh, to keep, you know, and the people who would normally sit in those pews just moved the ropes and sat down and thought, oh, you're saving the pew for me. <laughs> yeah, so, and the thing is, you know, you're there. That's the main thing. Right, whether you're sitting in the back, and plus I can see everybody. I can see the people sitting in the back. You know, I'm not that blind yet. Um, you're there. You're receiving the gifts. And then this is how the divine service unfolds. Uh, yesterday I mentioned we had questioning, and one of the questions I, I asked, we do the confirmation and stuff like that. And there's a little liturgy actually for questioning, and it's a lot of fun. And but there's three questions that we talk about throughout confirmation class, and and one is. Why do we call it the divine service? And then that leads to the next question, which is, and I've talked about this before, but why is it, why is it okay to be bored? And they put in parentheses, peaceful during divine service. And then, and then the third question is, how do you know you're saved? One upon the other, they build. And so the second one, you know, why is it okay to just sort of sit there? Because God, you know, one God's doing all the work, you're there as a guest. So think about what happens during the divine service. He brings you to church, and we come in as beggars, thinking, you know, I'm going to be in the presence of God. I have no business being here. I mean, I pray that every Sunday before I preach. I got no business being here. And uh, um, anyway, uh, 
what happens is the divine service unfolds. Well, first he absolves you, showers you with the righteousness of Christ, he preaches his word upon you, uh, and then he calls you up. Not like an altar call, but he, he, let's say it this way, using the text, he invites you up. And he sets you, you know, at his table and feeds you in front of everybody. You know, that's really cool. That's what the sacrament is pointing us towards, what God is going to do for us, what he does to do for us each Sunday. And, and our attitude when we walk in the churches, you know, that's why we call it divine service. He has called us to that meal. And we hear the invitation and everything like that. And uh, he brings us, you know, uh, and again, don't turn that into some sort of altar call thing. The, the key there is that invitation. It's still God doing it all. Um, and, and there's a little more there that I can unpack. We'll worry at 925, so we're going to stop here. But the point is, you're worthy of nothing. And God gives you everything. He invites you. He brings you in. In fact, we have other parables. He actually dresses us for the wedding. Uh, he, he feeds you. He provides you everything. And you deserve none of it. You know, you're an outsider. You're out in the streets. You're out in the alleys. You're not, you weren't actually invited in the first place. But he still wants you with him. And one of the things that we learn is that he doesn't give up on you either. He never does. Um, there's hope for all those people that we pray for uh, that uh, have turned their back on the church. And today's Saturday, so that's part of our, our Saturday prayer as we pray for those who have fallen away. Um, all right, so let's stop there and confess our, let, confess our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for faithfulness until the very end. And we pray for the renewal of those who are withering in the faith and for those who have fallen away. Bless us with receptive hearts and minds to your holy word as we gather tomorrow on your day. We, felt, we pray that you would bless my brothers in office and me and the people as my brothers and I prepare to administer and your people prepare to receive Christ's holy gifts. As always, we ask you to be with those who are crying out to you for healing, and according to your gracious will, place your healing hand upon them, keeping them ever mindful of your victory over death itself. Bless those who travel, allow them to reach their destination safely. All this we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, for evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Turn to hymn 621. Let all mortal flesh keep silent. Let all mortal flesh keep silence, and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly he minded, for with blessing in his hand, Christ our God to earth descending, comes our homage to demand. King of kings, yet born of Mary, as of old on earth he stood. Lord of lords in human vesture, 
in the body and the blood he will give to all the faithful his own self for heavenly food. Rank on rank the host of heaven spreads its vanguard on the way. As the light of light descending from the realms of endless day comes the powers of hell to vanquish as the darkness clears away. At his feet the sixth-winged seraph, cherubim with sleepless eye, veil their faces to the presence, as with ceaseless voice they cry, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Alleluia, Lord Most High. That's an incredible and one of my favorites from the Liturgy of St. James, 5th century. So sometime in the 400s, our brothers and sisters in Christ gave us that beautiful hymn. With that, my brothers and sisters, I pray a blessed rest for each of you, and God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night. Remember, sync with the Maya with the youth group, 4.30 to 7.30 tomorrow. Good night.